Hi and welcome to WA Blinko. I'm Wayne, author of Broken Seas Fire and Xander Salvation. You can find those two books on the Amazon bookstore under my author name of WA Blinko. Broken Seas Fire, however, is available on other platforms such as Apple, Google and Kobo and Barnes and Noble. This week I've got another little treat for you because although I haven't been making any content recently, I have been doing stuff behind the scenes, one of which was an interview with another self-published author. Um, she came on board for my uh, podcast channel, Sci-Fi Fans, so that's why the in the interview starts off with an introduction to Sci-Fi Fans, so uh, just thought I'd explain that a little bit. Without further ado, here is the interview that Zia Owen was kind enough to give me, and uh, yeah, hope you enjoy. Cheers. Hi and welcome to Sci-Fi Fans. Today's guest is powered by 80s hair band Ballads. She's afraid of dark basements and movies of the paranormal. She doesn't watch them. Her heroines are passionate women that overcome all odds and find their own versions of success. And in the end, they all have their um, happy ending at the end of her stories. I am talking about no one other than Z Irwin. So Z, welcome to the podcast. I uh, really appreciate you coming on board. Thank you. Happy to be here. That's it, right? Um, so what are you writing at the moment? I see you've got approximately four books on Amazon at the moment. Two of them are available already and there's a couple of pre-orders. So what yes, are you up? My, my third book comes out this week, so it's been a little hectic around here. But yes, yeah. it's a series of uh, contemporary steamy romance that I've been writing uh, set in Boston, Boston, Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, and it's been fun to write. It's a billionaire, billionaire romance because you know every every guy you want to fall in love with has to be loaded, like you know, millions, billions. Sure, and some women would be nice as well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, there's somebody for everybody. <laughs> so, um, the love. so what what got you into into writing, Z? So I always was a very imaginative person and I would, you know, these scenarios would always come into my head and um, with a vivid imagination, you know, with no really an outlet. I never sought an outlet for it. Right. But, uh, uh, and I lived very happily many, many years without giving my characters an outlet. And then discovered um, late in 2016, I had a um, historical romance idea in my head and the characters during a two hour commute every day to, to and from work would just speak to me. And it just, it got to the point where it was driving me crazy. So I remember over the Christmas break, just frantically writing up this, this first attempt at a novel. And so, uh, so that was my start. But I, as much as I love a good historical romance, primarily set back in like the 1880s um, yeah. of, of United States history, you know, the kind of era and going West and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, it's just the research got to me and, you know, I, I don't know, you know, it's not my era. So the additional having to figure out how do they dress, how do they move, what did they have available at the time, you know, that kind of thing um, quickly got to me. And so I, I put that first effort aside. Plus, let's face it, had no idea how to write a romance. And so, so that one got put aside real quickly. And so like, but I just kept tampering with it and tinkering with it and trying to find and read more and try to find what kind of romance I did want to write. So did you have the idea, is this an idea that you've had for a very long time? Then. In my current series, yeah. So my cur current series is amazing. I was I was in the middle of writing two other series of contemporary Western romance, uh, cowboy you know romance. Of course, they were millionaires as well. But <laughs> <laughs> and um and this um this small town billionaire series, which I, both of which I will finish. But in the middle of all that, got this idea in December. Right. Just, just more than six months ago in December for three roommates living in Boston who each of them finds the love of their lives. And right. I, I originally thought it would be a holiday themed series. Um, and, and, you know, everything, everything turns out happy ever after the whole thing, like romance usually does. Uh, but it ended up just taking over. And so here I am four books in, I've got a fourth book coming out in the, in the fourth book coming in a little while and five or six books planned. So, yeah. Right. So it's quite a detailed series then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Each roommate got their book and then each of the two sisters got their book. <laughs> so that's how it goes in the series. Yeah. So um, you say this is one of the series that you've, you've written. Are there any other series then that aren't necessarily available on Amazon? 
Yeah. So like I said, the cowboy Western, you know, it's kind of a small town set in Montana, um, modern day Montana. I grew up in Montana for a little time. So, you know, I have those kind of roots. So I have that um, series going. And then, um, which I thought about putting as a Kindle Vela. I don't right. know. But, yeah. uh, you know, the work that that takes, I'm just not quite there yet. Um, and then the small town billionaire series is just kind of a, a little fictitious town in New York that yeah. um, this billionaire started and, you know, and all these small town, you know, loves and pursuits happen. So. <laughs> So where can we find your other stories then? So um, as soon as they're available, I mean, they'll be out on Amazon. Uh, the current the current um, series is Amazon KU. I haven't gone wide yet. Um, I may in the future, but just starting out, I wanted to just get my get my feet wet. So that's okay. right, Matt. Yeah. So what the um, the paranormal? You don't watch paranormal, so I'm guessing it's nothing. <laughs> Well, I did just watch The Quiet Place 2 last night with my husband, and I was okay. I survived that, you know. I don't know. There's just something oogie about, you know, ghosts and, you know. Right. I, I mean, I grew up when, uh, what was it, poltergeist movies yeah. were, were out, and those, it just freaked me out. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not that kind of a, I, I have watched, I don't know if there's like maybe a step above paranormal, not too poor paranormally but <laughs> like i watched um what is it uh, the sixth sense you know everyone knows the sixth sense with Bruce I willis i mean i could handle that you know light stuff i can handle but i don't know completely like demonized ghosty <laughs> scary <laughs> stuff no and then also things like uh slasher movies you know where where they're like uh I don't know, elm street or <laughs> Those kinds of things I never watched either. Um, but, you know, if it's light stuff, I'm okay with it. So, but yeah, and I definitely don't like basements. Definitely. That is so true. Um, I lived in California for a long time and we didn't have basements out there. And so, you know, when I moved to Montana and then later in life to Pennsylvania, it's like, oh my God, I have to deal with basements. And so, you know, prime requirement for our current house was I have to be able to get, you know, be comfortable walking down in the basement. <laughs> So you got a basement now then? <laughs> I do have a basement now. It is light. I hardly go down there. Right. I, I will go down there. It's fine. It's just not my favorite place. So. That's, that's fair enough. <laughs> so, um, okay, obviously this is sci-fi fans. Yeah. Uh, so. I do like sci-fi. I do like sci-fi. Like, and I don't, okay, we should probably talk about sci-fi though, because, that's fine. clarify, because oh. I have to say, my sci-fi, <laughs> since yeah. I have two teenage boys has been the Marvel series, right? That's my sci-fi, but, right. it, oh, and Star Trek. My, I watched Star Trek. Uh, my mom was a big Star Trek fan from the original days, watched a lot of those when I was younger. So Star Trek is okay. Yeah. What else so, is, what else is considered sci-fi? Well, the Martian, the Mar the recent Martian one. I mean, yeah. I guess I do. I guess I have watched more sci-fi than I think. Um, what would be for you, what would be the ideal romance in science fiction? Okay, the reason I thought that you and I should talk is because I absolutely loved WandaVision. Right. Did, you, did you watch WandaVision? I did. Okay, and that's sci-fi, isn't it? That is. Okay. Well, I think it's sci-fi, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, oh my gosh, how could you not adore that couple? Like, you, we saw them, Wanda and Vision, throughout the whole, you know, movie series, right? And then they come out with their own series, and of course, she grounds it in like, you know, 1950s, 1960s television, like from the US anyway. I don't know if these were familiar to you being yeah. from the UK, but yeah. Well, some of those, um, mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. yeah, we've got essentially a lot of the uh, older American comedies over here in the UK, not at the same time, obviously, because we we're a few years behind on, on some of them. But yeah, I liked the transitions with WandaVision, how it evolved from the 50s and then brought it up to date with, yeah. Each, there was 60s there was 70s like they were you know all along the way you could see the house change a little bit each time and their clothing would change and yeah. you know all that it was it was really amazing I thought that the characterization between the two of them were so well done um you know that they're in love already when we enter the series so you're seeing the maturation of their you know their relationship as it goes on but you can tell their their love and you see their journey you know their individual character journeys through it um, of course, then all the sci-fi stuff gets in the way. 
<laughs> no, it was very well done. I thought I thought um, that Marvel did a great job on that. And having said that, Nell, have you watched Loki? Yes, I have. Okay, okay. So I also am enamored with how much he had such a character growth during that whole series. Yeah. And then there was a little interesting love interest, something going on there where he was, you know, not only faced with himself, um, like, you know, a mirror brought up to his face by all these other Lokis and everything else and having to face all the bad things he'd done and, you know, really grow from all of that. But then he also kind of fell in love with that other Loki and, yeah, I don't know. It's just a, such a shame they ended it the way I did. <laughs> there should have been the happy ever after for the two of them, and Disney teased us and took it away from us. So that could possibly be in season two, couldn't it? Maybe it's kind of open. I know. Um, yes, big Star Wars fans here. I mean, I was in line when I was a little girl for the original Star Wars way back when. So yes, yeah. Star Wars is in my blood, and of course, it's now in my kids' blood. So, you know, we had to make sure that they. My, I think my son for three summers in a row watched the entire Star Wars series, you know, nonstop, <laughs> which is great. Um, no, Star Wars, I love, and um, interesting little bits of romance here and there in it, uh, and clearly in the original three, you had the Han Solo. Yeah, you, know, you had the um, trio with Lay. I'm out in Empire. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you had you had the um, in the more recent ones. You know, you saw the maturation of of you know Han and Leia, of course. Um, but even like there's some feelings between um, between Ray and um, a couple of the characters. You know, Ray and the the other evil guy and. Yeah. And the other guy and you know you see all this you know interesting stuff happening of course it's disney disneyized so you know yeah. there's there's no kissing no you know <laughs> <laughs> nothing else like that but you know it is it is the same concepts of romance you know that um the the tug and pull the the attraction yeah. the push apart the you know just go say that that's can be used as quite a good plot point isn't it is mm -hmm. Opposites attract, and then they say there's a very fine line between love and hate. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. That balance, and that can bring elements to a story, can't it? Um, that otherwise you possibly wouldn't consider. Of everything's just going to be black and white, good, bad. But it's more than that in real life, isn't it? There's always intrigue, the um, the, the lack of understanding sometimes, great the conflict, mm -hmm. and then as characters progress in the story arc evolves they overcome those issues and actually end up falling in love <laughs> <laughs> yes there's lots of gray areas and i think somebody wrote about gray <laughs> in romance long ago 50 shades of gray in fact no but um yeah there is a lot of gray area and it's that constant will they won't they and the push and pull and it creates that angst and it does provide for great plot points i imagine in a sci-fi which when you're writing sci-fi there is I've seen quite a bit lately about sci-fi romance coming out where, you know, it is the sci-fi um, driving the plot, but the romance is that subplot, that underlayer and that undercurrent of emotions. And it kind of affects their decisions that are happening in the sci-fi part of it, you know, and it's that constant will they, won't they and tug and pull and the angst. And that's what creates such an interest in the characters, you know, and and driving their their story and their um, ability to change from start to finish. So, do you think at some point you might do a science fiction romance? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you never say never as an author. I'd have if somebody wanted a partner, somebody do the sci-fi side, and I'll do the romance side. <laughs> that could be a possibility. Mm -hmm. it's, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't read enough sci-fi. Like movies are one thing, but yeah. I don't read it enough to know like how to write that sci-fi part of it myself. And so, yeah, it'd probably be a partner situation. Okay. So um, obviously you're saying that the, uh, the Wild West and that kind of inspired you for a series. Where do you draw your inspiration from? Who would inspire you as an author to write your next book? I know. I who would inspire me as an author to write my next book like my muse yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know because i don't know where i get these ideas from but they just come to me they always have my imagination has always run wild um mm -hmm. 
when I think about the the Montana series that I was writing and will finish, um, mm-hmm. you know, I just I grew up in Montana for a time, and so there was this cute little tiny small town that wasn't even a dot on the map like it, it's not even a town it's not even anything it's like you drive through and there's a mailbox stop that's it you know and um but my family grew up around there and we would visit all the time and so that I just am able to take you know thoughts of that and apply it and what if you know what if it was a little bigger and what if there were these characters and what if you know what if what if and you constantly ask yourself what if what if and you kind of start building that um the ideas around it my uh, my Still Valley Still Valley Billionaire series is what that uh, the the billionaires in the small town of New York are called, and um, with that one, I just uh, uh, actually had written um, probably in 2017 a standalone about um, a rich guy who owns this this uh, I don't know if you remember Dirty Dancing. Do you know the movie Dirty Dancing? I do. Okay, I've got a <laughs> you got what? I- ballroom. To dirty dancing. Oh, I love strictly ballroom. Uh, <laughs> well, dirty dancing um, was uh, in that plot. There, the family is visiting um, back in the old days. Used to have these grand hotels that people would go to in the summer, and they'd have you know all kinds of activities for the family to do and all that. And so that's in dirty dancing. So I meshed that with um, with the idea of this billionaire starting a small town in the middle of nowhere in a valley, and he builds this grand hotel, and then it's a small town that supports it, and there's all these characters. So um, I don't know. I'm able to just romanticize the things. I guess you think a little too much from my past. You know, oh look how quaint this small town in Montana. It's not even on the map. And oh look how quaint this dirty dancing thing is. Is, you know, and you kind of just yeah. marry them, marry them together. But um, I think I think part of it is a person has to be really comfortable listening to their creativity, yeah, and letting that flourish, and um, just taking any little idea and constantly asking, okay, what if, what if, what if, and write it all down. So what I've started doing is I have a notebook; it's about half filled from half my life, and I just um, anybody I've met that I can remember, like who was that person and what was that person like, and um, a lot of times uh, my characters will be mesh of those in the past, you know, and and um, so that's kind of helped me to not run out of an idea because I've got this notebook then. Oh, remember how that person met this other person? Maybe I can play off that as a character, you know, things right. like that. Because I was going to ask you about your writing process and you've touched a little bit on that with your notebook. Is there any other, anything else about your writing process that kind of keeps you going? I wish I could call it a process. I kind of feel like it's just all across the board right now. So, um, I mean, I don't know how other authors do it. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So I wrote and then I wrote and wrote and wrote. And then so I wrote book one. Yeah. Which ended up being book two because then I decided to write another book one. Right. And then I so I had these two books written, you know, ready to go, needed to be edited, edited those. But then in the editing process, just that back and forth and that different use of my brain, you know, I. I don't know, I didn't balance it very well. So I have to say with book three coming off this week <laughs> has been quite the interesting learning experience. So um, with book three, I just, it's been a rough summer. I just couldn't get the the story going and the words going, but I loved these characters and I loved the story. I just had to figure it all out. And it just, it took a lot more time than I expected. Uh, so with book four coming out, I certainly hope <laughs> I've reflected on this whole process and have come up with some new process because I don't want to repeat a book three, that's for sure. <laughs> so what made you realise or what? when did you realise that the first book would actually make a good second book and then gave yourself the task of writing the first book again? Because yeah. that's yeah yeah exactly because uh, when I thought of these three roommates in Boston um, I thought of the, the one character who's in the second book, Cassidy. And um, I was immediately, like I literally wrote that book in, in 30 days. It was awesome. I loved it. It came out of me, nothing, no problems. Right. And I was thinking about how can I do a prequel to lead into the series then? Because, you know, everyone's like, oh, you need a reader magnet. You need this, you need that, you know, that a short story, <laughs> all this kind of stuff. And so I started thinking, okay, how did these three roommates get, 
you know, get into this apartment together. How did this come to be? Maybe that could be the, the prequel. Well, that ended up being the one room eight story. And so that was book one instead of a prequel because Lord knows I cannot write a short story to save my life. Once I get into the characters, I'm done. I'm going. You know, there's no stopping. 45, 65,000 words. There's my short story. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, it, it, you know, planning out a series, I think, is another learning curve that I definitely am taking to heart for the next one, you know. Okay. So two books are on, are available already. Mm -hmm. another one, and another two are available for pre-order. Yeah, and then actually the third one is releasing this week, so it will be available. Yeah. When will the fourth one be available? So I actually set the fourth one uh, prequel date of December 31st for launching, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be November, but That'd nice to have that little leeway, yeah. Because you, you do writing sprints as well. Yes, I do. And, and yeah, I'm, I really appreciate those. They're and I would say to anybody listening or watching the video who wants to become an author and, and get motivated that writing sprints are great, they, they help a great deal because it takes away the loneliness of the writing process. Absolutely. I yeah. find it can be a lonely process, can't it? Yes, it's it's very isolating if you're writing by yourself, you know, in a way it's great because sometimes you need those alone times. You just want to power through and not be bothered and get into it, you know, but yeah. then most of the time, it's easy to put off writing when you have a life, you've got like work, you've got kids, you know, all this other stuff going on. And, uh, and so you don't get your writing in and pretty soon five days have passed and you've got no writing in. And so for me, when I, when I got serious about this and I said to myself um, during quarantines, I said, okay, yeah. I've said I was going to publish since 2017 and I wrote my book 2016 in December and I have not made it happen. I've made a lot of strides, you know, and I've come along and all that. But um, this is the year I've decided this is the year I'm going to do it. And so um, the biggest thing that happened for me was I wrote another novel in NaNoWriMo, NaNoWriMo if I could say that word. Sure. And <laughs> uh, that was my billionaire series in New York. So I wrote that and that got me motivated. And I thought, OK, I can do this. You know, this is really good. This one turned out good. I don't know what happened. But everything I've learned up until now somehow got into that book. And so I decided to, um, you know, reach out, talk more to people on Facebook, other authors and things like that. And I reached out to someone else and they said, hey, let's start our own Facebook group for authors. So we did that middle of December and we decided to do sprints. So we scheduled two sprints a week. I have another friend who schedules two other sprints a week. And so between those four sprints, just having the consistency and making sure my life is arranged around not missing those sprints if I can help it. You know, that is like my work time. You know, we all show up for work. We have a certain time we have to be there, or do something and be disciplined. And those were my times. And that became like um, my inspiration to write, to edit, to be productive for my writing time, um, inspiration, uh, fun to be with others, that, yeah. that coffee cooler talk, you know, we want to go and grab a cup of, cup of coffee when we're working in an office and chat with somebody. Well, that's what these were, you know, in between sprints, getting, just having some familiar faces that you can uh, draw life from in order to, you know, sit down and be motivated to write has been great. Definitely. Totally agree with that. They, they've um, certainly helped me with my writing when I've joined some of your groups. Um, yeah, it, it's it's that focus, isn't it? It's that twenty minute focus period, and as you say, the free chat afterwards for five minutes, and then back to work. And as you say, people do get together. It becomes like work because when you want to be an author, that's what you want. You want that as your passion, as your job. Uh, they really do help get organised. What advice would you give to somebody that wants to become an author? What, what advice would you give? Think very hard. Think very carefully now about the path ahead. Um, I don't know. I Well, I would say, it, you know, it's not an overnight success thing. And those are the unicorns that are. And so it's a slow building process. I came from the entrepreneurial world. So I've had other businesses. I taught it. Like, this is my my jam is entrepreneurship. And that's why I love, you know, the idea of being a self-published author and being in charge of my destiny and, you know, taking on, you know, both the marketing and the creative side and pushing my work out there so that it's all stuff that I love. Um, but 
you know, not everyone's like that. And so I think you have some people who love the writing side and are really awesome at the craft side of things, but aren't awesome at the marketing side or have no clue what to do in the marketing, vice versa, you know, and, and um, I guess I think I'm one of those people that are probably in the middle. I'm not saying I'm great at the craft side. I'm just saying I can do it. <laughs> and I love the marketing side. And so um, I think the best advice I can give is to, you know, research your genre. Yeah. I had to do a lot of reading. I, I knew I wanted to write romance. I love romance, but I didn't know at first that all the different genres. And I didn't know that there were certain expectations for writing. I'm sure it's probably the same in sci-fi. There's got to be some kind of expectations there. And, and yeah, there it's not meant to stifle your creativity. It's just meant to, you know, this is what people like to read. And if you like to read it too, clearly yeah. that's, you know, an indication. Um I found most often if a reader likes, if a writer likes to read what they're writing, if that's kind of their, their thing that they like to read, then they're usually pretty good at writing it too. Um, you say you, your background's entrepreneurship, so <laughs> have a little bit more info on that. <laughs> so I, okay, let's see, what have I done? I've done a little bit of everything, like little, little things where you sell things, you know, from home, stuff like that. But I also owned... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I owned a um, a bridal shop. I owned a flower shop, bridal shop combination. So um, for about five years in our little town, I had started a, a bridal shop and we put the two old shops out of business and, you know, kept, and it's still going. I mean, I started it in 2002 and the shop is still there. I sold it in 2006 right. and the shop is still going. And I'm so proud of, so dang proud of that because, you know, how often does a small business start and actually, you know, even exist beyond five years? So I was pretty proud of that. But, um, but I had a lot of interesting stories from that time in the wedding world. <laughs> I mean, you know, talk about romance um, opportunities, you know, for stories. I've got a lot of them from that, a lot of interesting stuff. There will be a, ro a, will be a wedding planner series in my romance novels at some point. <laughs> so, yeah, that was that was my biggest one. But I had some others that I was pretty, pretty good at and, you know, selling things and stuff like that. So um, but I also uh, then became a teacher of entrepreneurship for young people. Right. And I loved lo I love that. I still I still am in it this to this yeah. day in that field um and it's one of my favorite things is to inspire young people to yeah i'm gonna I, I really actually love to do a um something a course or something for young authors you know under 18 who want to know how to be a self-published author like i think that's a cool um area that uh, i think so often most of the obviously almost 100% of the stuff out there teaching people how to do self-publishing is directed toward adults. But I think it'd be cool if a class took it on, an English class took on the the idea of, you know, writing a book and learning how to self-publish. Think if you were, if you were in your high school age or in your younger school age years and you went through something like that, like how much further ahead would you be in your book writing? Had you known you wanted to be a writer back then? You know? I want to be a writer since the age of 15, 16. Um, so something like that would certainly have been beneficial to me because I, I do believe that it's a bit of a myth when people think you have to be of a certain age to be an author. Yeah. If you store in the talent inside you from an early age, I mean, J.K. Rowling wanted to know, she knew she wanted to be a writer from the age of 12. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean. The problem with school, yeah, and the problem with school is that we don't nurture enough of that individual creativity yeah. in students, especially or recognize those who have potential talent and let them work on that talent to develop it further. You yeah. know, instead, it, it becomes sidebar to all the core stuff that they're required to learn and all the testing and stuff. So this is really a goal of mine. I really I don't know how I'll make it happen or what I'll do, but I would really like to you know, bring this to young people and say, take your creativity that at a young age, you are, you have no fear at that point in your life, you know, so ideas are flowing and you're, you're not like um, jaded by your adult years, you know, granted, there's a lot of experience that can come into writing as you age, you know, that's, that's beneficial. And maybe they don't have as lot of, uh, as much deep emotional connection yet you know with the world but I still think they can be nurtured and their talent can be you know um, helped and, and especially in self-publishing which is a business side which they don't get a lot of education on either you know <laughs> so um, so I think it could be a fun project someday 
Yeah, that, that sounds really good, and and that's inspirational in itself. See, I, I, I think yeah, that would be such a positive thing to do for for kids, because um, as I say, if you've got a good story, you just need that nurturing um, mentor just to come along and show you how how it's done and so that you can grow. And so perhaps one day we'll have a Z Irwin Writing Foundation. Something like that. <laughs> Yeah, um, no, and I, I think sci-fi too. Uh, imagine the game, the gamers out there. Uh, there is, there's this, I keep telling my sons this, you know, they're doing a little bit what I do. They're coming up with a story and a world and they're coming up with characters and you believe in these characters and you, you help them fight from start to finish through the whole game. And there's the story arc of the game. And, you know, it is, their story is in their lives, you know? And so I imagine that um, there's gotta be some really good sci-fi minds coming up from the generations lower than me <laughs> who have had these experiences and games and stuff like that who can, you know, they're going to be the ones coming up with the next sci, you know, sci-fi, Star Trek, Star Wars, you know, yeah. the whole um, sagas in our future worlds. All right. And I think I'm going to wrap it up here then, see if it's all right. Yep. Uh, so just let us know. Now, tell us, give us uh, your book. Where Where is it again? It's on Amazon. Sure. Yep. Amazon and KU. It's called the Faded Loves series. And so book one, this is fate. Book two, that was then. Book three is all this time and it is out um, this coming week. And then book four will be on, is on pre-order, all my love. So okay. that is where I'm at. You can also go to zirwin.com. Zirwinauthor.com. Sorry. Thank you very much for coming on to Sci-Fi. You're Red. welcome. And if I, there are a couple people um, in our group who's writing, you know, some things sci-fi-ish yeah. and stuff. So I'll definitely refer them to you for for this if you want. Yeah. yeah love to have them on board. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure, and I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us on here. I've found out one or two things about you that I didn't know beforehand. <laughs> All good. And, uh, and, okay, and I'll see you soon. All right. Thank you so much for having me. All right. No worries. Thank you, Z. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.